Hello, welcome back. We are reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and we're on chapter two. So, so far in chapter one, we were introduced to the four Pevensey children, uh, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, and they're off in the Fresser's house, big giant house, and they're exploring. They uh, come up into a room that has a wardrobe, nothing to see here, uh, but Lucy is a little more curious, and she finds her way into the wardrobe, and has discovered Narnia. Now, at the end of the last chapter, she had just met the fawn and startled him. He dropped all his packages. Good evening, said Lucy, but the fawn was so busy picking up his parcels that he did not at first reply. When he had finished, it made her a little bow. Good evening, good evening, said the fawn. Excuse me, I don't mean to be inquisitive, but should I be right in thinking that you are a daughter of Eve? My name's Lucy, she said, not quite understanding him. But you are, forgive me, you are what they call girl, said the fawn. Of course I'm a girl, said Lucy. You are in fact human? Of course I'm human, said Lucy, still a little puzzled. To be sure, to be sure, said the fawn. How stupid of me, but I've never seen a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve before. I'm delighted. That is to say, and then he stopped, as if he was going to say something that he had not intended, but he remembered in time. Delighted, delighted, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Thomas. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. And may I ask, O oh, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, how have you come into Narnia? Narnia? What's that? said Lucy. This is the land of Narnia, said the fawn, where we are now. All that lies between the lamppost and the great castle of Perperavel on the Eastern Sea. And you, you have come into the wild woods of the West. I, I got into the wardrobe in the spare room, said Lucy. Ah, said Mr. Tumnus in a rather melancholy voice. If only I had worked harder in geography when I was a little fawn, I should no doubt know all about these strange countries. Ah, but it's too late now. But they aren't any countries at all, said Lucy, almost laughing. It's only just back there, at least... Well, I'm not sure. It's summer there. Meanwhile, said Mr. Tumnus, it's winter in Narnia and has been for ever so long. And we shall both catch cold if we stand here talking in the snow. Daughter of Eve, from the far land of Sparum, where eternal summer reigns around the bright city of Wardrobe, how would it be if you came and had tea with me? Thank you very much, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, but I was wondering whether I ought to be getting back. It's just around the corner, said the fawn, and there'll be a roaring fire and toast and sardines and cake. Well, it's very kind of you, said Lucy, but I shan't be able to stay long. Well, if you take my arm, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, I shall be able to hold the umbrella over both of us. That way, now, off we go. And so Lucy found herself walking through the wood, arm in arm with this strange creature as if they had known one another their whole lives. They had not gone far before they came to a place where the ground became rough and there was rocks all about with little hills up and little hills down. At the bottom of one small valley, Mr. Tumnus turned suddenly aside as if he was going to walk right into an unusually large rock. But at the last moment, Lucy found he was leading her into the entrance of a cave. As soon as they were inside, she found herself blinking in the light of a wood fire. Then Mr. Tumnus stooped down and took a flaming piece of wood out of the fire with a neat little pair of tongs and lit a lamp. Now we shan't be long, he said, and immediately put the kettle on. Lucy thought she had never been to a nicer place. It was a little dry, clean cave of reddish stone with a carpet on the floor and two little chairs, one for me 
and one for a friend, said Mr. Tumnus. And a table and a dresser and a mantelpiece over the fire. And above that, a picture of an old fawn with a gray beard. In one corner, there was a door which Lucy thought must lead to Mr. Tumnus's bedroom. And on one wall was a shelf full of books. Lucy looked at these while he was setting out the tea things. They had titles like The Life and Letters of Silenus, or Nymphs and Their Ways, or Men, Monks, and Gamekeepers, A Study in Popular Legend, or Is Man a Myth? Now, daughter of Eve, said the fawn, and really it was a wonderful tea. It was a nice brown egg, lightly boiled for each of them, and then sardines on toast, and then buttered toast, and then toast with honey, and then sugar-topped cake. And when Lucy was tired of eating, the fawn began to talk. He had wonderful tales to tell of life in the forest. He told about the midnight dances and how the nymphs who lived in the wells and the dryads who lived in the trees came out to dance with the fawns about long hunting parties uh, after the milk white stag that could give you wishes if you caught him, about feasting and treasure seeking with the wild red dwarfs in deep mines and caverns far beneath the forest floor. And then about summer when the woods were green and the old Silenus fat on it, sat on his fat donkey and would come to visit him. And sometimes Bacchus himself and then the streams would run with wine instead of water and the whole forest would give itself up for jollification for weeks on end. Not that it isn't always winter now, he added gloomily. Then to cheer himself up, he took out from his case on the dresser a strange little flute that looked as if it was made of straw and began to play. And the tune that he played made Lucy want to cry and laugh and dance and go to sleep all at the same time. It must have been hours later when she shook herself and said, Oh, Mr. Tumnus, I'm sorry to stop you. And I do love that tune, but really I must go home. I only meant to stay for a few minutes. It's no good now, you know, said the fawn, laying down his flute and shaking his head. Oh, so sorrowfully. No good, said Lucy, jumping up and feeling rather frightened. What do you mean? I've got to go home at once. The others will be wondering what has happened to me. But a moment later, she asked Mr. Tumnus, whatever's the matter? For the fawn's brown eyes had filled with tears. And then the tears began trickling down his cheeks. And soon they were running off the end of his nose. And at last, it covered his face. He covered his face in his hands and he began to howl. Mr. Tumnus, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy in great distress. Don't, don't. What's the matter? Aren't you well? Dear Mr. Tumnus, you tell me what's wrong. But the fawn continued sobbing as if its heart would break. And even when Lucy went over and put her arms around him and lent him her hand handkerchief, he did not stop. He merely looked at her handkerchief and kept on using it, wringing it out with both hands whenever it got too wet to be of any more use. So that presently, Lucy was standing in a dance. Mr. Tumnus bawled Lucy in his ear, shaking him. Do stop. Stop it at once. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, a great big fawn like you. What on earth are you crying about? Oh, oh, sobbed Mr. Tumnus. I'm crying because I am such a bad fawn. I don't think you're a bad fawn at all, said Lucy. I think you are a very good fawn. You are the nicest fawn that I've ever met. Oh, oh. You wouldn't say that if you knew, replied Mr. Tumnus between his sobs. No, I'm a bad fawn. I don't suppose there was ever any a worse fawn since the beginning of the world. But what have you done? asked Lucy. My old father now, said Mr. Tumnus. That's his picture over the mantelpiece. He would never have done a thing like this. A thing like what, said Lucy. Like what I've done, said the fawn. I've taken service under the white witch. And now that I am, I'm in the pay of the White Witch. The White Witch? Who's she? Why she? Why it is she that has got all of Narnia under her thumb. It is she that makes it always winter. Always winter and never Christmas. Think of that. How awful, said Lucy. But what does she pay you? But what does she pay you for? Oh, that's the worst of it, said Mr. Tumnus with a deep groan. I'm a kidnapper for her. 
That's what I am. Look at me, daughter of Eve. Who would you believe that I'm the sort of fawn to meet a poor, innocent child in the wood? One that would never have done me any harm and pretend to be friendly with it and invite it to my cave, all for the sake of lulling it to sleep and then handing it over to the white witch? No, said Lucy, I'm sure you wouldn't do anything of the sort, but I have said the fawn. Well, said Lucy rather slowly, for she wanted to be truthful and yet had not, not to be too hard on me. Well, it was pretty bad, but you're so sorry for it, and I'm sure you'll never do it again. Daughter of Eve, don't you understand, said the fawn. It isn't something I have done. I'm doing it now, this very moment. What do you mean, cried Lucy, turning very white. You are the child, said Mr. Tummins. I have orders from the white witch that if I ever saw a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve in the wood, that I was to catch them and hand them over to her. And you are the first that I've ever met. And I've been pretending to be your friend and ask you to tea. And all the time I've been meaning to wait until you're asleep and then go and tell her. Oh, but you won't, Mr. Tony, said Lucy. You won't, will you? Indeed, you mustn't. And if I don't, he said, beginning to cry again, she's sure to find out. And she'll have my tail cut off and my horn sawed off and my beard plucked out. And she'll wave her hand over my beautiful cloven hoofs and turn them into horrid, solid hoofs like a wretched horse. And if she is extra, especially angry, she'll turn me into stone and I shall only be a statue of a fawn in her horrible house until the four thrones at Care Paravel are filled and goodness knows when that will be or whether it will ever happen at all. I'm very sorry, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, but please, let me go home. Of course I will, said the fawn. Of course I've got to. I see that now. I haven't known what humans are like before I met you. Of course I can't give you up to the witch. And now that I know you, but we must be off at once. I'll see you back to the lamppost. I suppose you can find your way back to the uh, spare oom and wardrobe. I'm sure I can, said Lucy. But we must go quietly as we can, said Mr. Tummins. The whole wood is full of her spies. Even some of the trees are on her side. They both got up and they left the tea things on the table. And Mr. Tumnus once more put up his umbrella and gave Lucy his arm. And they went into the snow. The journey back was not at all like the journey to the Fawn's cave. They stole along as quickly as they could without speaking a word. And Mr. Tumnus kept to the darkest places. Lucy was relieved when they finally reached the last person. Do you know your way home from here, daughter of Eve? Said Mr. Tumnus. Lucy looked very hard between the trees and she could just see the, in the distance a patch of light that looked like daylight. Yes, she said, I can see the wardrobe door. Then be off as quick as you can, said the fawn, and can, can you ever forgive me for what I meant to do? Why, of course I can, said Lucy, shaking him heartily by the hand, and I hope that you won't get into dreadful trouble on my account. Farewell, daughter of Eve, he said. Perhaps I may keep the handkerchief? Indeed, said Lucy, and then ran towards the far-off patch of daylight as quickly as her legs would carry her. And presently, instead of rough branches brushing against her, she felt coats. And instead of crunching snow under her feet, she felt wooden boards. And all at once, she found herself jumping out of the wardrobe into the same empty room from which the whole adventure had started. She shut the wardrobe door tightly behind her and looked around, panting for breath. It was still raining, and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm here, she shouted. I'm here, I've come back all right. 